colors. And what I mean by that is that the minute we open our eyes to the world, we are perceiving and creating images and meanings. The difficulty is to perceive the world differently from what I already stored as perceptions. So it's easy for me to, to talk about the pains that I've experienced, talk about the pains that are similar to the ones that I've experienced. What's more difficult is to be able to get into the perspective of someone that I don't know, of a group of people that I don't know, um, that I don't have shared experiences with. So the creative act is actually to swim against my own current, in a way, my own flow. And maybe if I tell it this way, it sounds like um, something that comes with effort. But it could come from effort if I decide actively to uh, look inside my thought and think, what would you say? W how would you behave? What would be the reasons that would make you behave the way that I am considering wrong? And it would, could also come from the implicit knowledge that I can get through knowing you, through the, just the act of meeting and listening and it comes with love. <laughs> I mean, like, I should also love your story. It doesn't sound like effort when we're listening to loved ones, right? So this is how I understand love, is the, um, that I consider you as a complex person. I consider your story as as complex as I could consider mine. So I'm not doing it as a gift. I'm not, I'm not living it as a gift. I am doing it because I am sincerely open and interested in what you have to say. And it doesn't happen if I don't meet you, if I don't ask you questions, if I don't see you living around. And this can happen through literature, that I am delving into the reality of someone else and the ability of fiction actually on us is that in enlarges the perspective that we have of the world because we kind of short have a shortcut towards the existence and the reality of others. In neuroscience and cognitive science, uh, we have something called the fundamental attribution uh, error. Is that I, when I behave, I see my behaviors and in their condition in the, in, with the external conditions. I explain my behaviors, putting them in the center of conditions that led me to do stuff. But I have less compassion to others because I don't see clearly the conditions, the external conditions. So I attribute to their behaviors internal reasons while I attribute to myself external ones. So fiction can help me also look at the external reasons that make people behave the way they do and en enlarges my empathy scale to something that is larger than what I do usually for myself. I consider artists as people in the center of, 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 of life itself and not at the corner of it. So they are kind of engaged more than other people in this type of interaction with others. They are sub we have the idea of artists being narcissistic because they are delving continuously inside their own effects and their own feelings. But they actually are supposed to be uh, sometimes getting out of their ego to be able to witness um, what also others around them experience. And so I think yeah, art is political in the way that um, it's, it is, it, I should be able as an artist to go beyond my own experience and to see it situated somewhere. Even when I'm describing um, a family story, I'm placing this family inside its cultural and social network. That's why it takes lots of knowledge. And knowledge, it takes lots of knowledge to feel legitimate to talk about something. And this knowledge comes from life experiences themselves, from my openness and, and the openness of an artist 
to, um, to, to first accept that my perception is biased and then um, to be humble enough to consider that anyone else than myself that didn't have the same life as mine has something very interesting to, te to teach me. Tolstoy, who is sometimes is a character somewhere in his book. But he, he works so hard to be able to, every time he's giving the voice to another character, to completely um, shift the gaze to the young woman, to the child, to the man, to the military guy. To, and then he leaves a space for him to voice what he thinks about all of this. So I kind of see it like as if Tolstoy said, I want to say things. OK, I'm going to give, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that voice inside the character so that I don't, so that I don't pollute the other gazes that should be around that character. And that takes lots of humility, but it also takes lots of knowledge and lots of research. So in order to create anything, we should also have a pool of experiences that cook somewhere, incubate, to call it incubation. And then we start experimenting, because it doesn't mean that, uh, that I'm going to give this perception out of nowhere. We experiment, we do trial and error, and then at some point I forget about myself. And at some point I feel that this storytelling went beyond me. It takes lots of discipline and it's maybe in opposition to what we consider as the sudden inspiration that comes from nowhere. And it's actually just the same exact process as building anything, as building any thought. Scientists do the same thing. It take, it's a process that is complex. And that, of course, relies on your past experiences and expertise. But it's, it's also following the same exact processes as building any material object. Because you process, you do pilots of it. And then you see if it works, if it fits. So the creative process, if you look at it in the brain, it's not in the left or right of brain. It's actually engaging many circuits, the executive circuit, that, that kind of makes sense of what am I doing, the default network that delves into my past experiences and it's what we call the imagination network, but also my salient, my salient network that is constantly reading information coming from the body and coming from the, uh, from also from the environment around me. And they are interacting continuously with each other. If, if you're looking at somebody painting for seven hours, it doesn't have to be um, um, a creative process. It could be technical, technical autonom autonomy, autonomous process. But then from time to time, you look at that, you look at that, and you shift it in a way that makes more sense. Uh, and, then, and then the product of this is actually the result of a very complex process. So we, we like to see artistic talent as something that comes with the potential, and then the, pro the product um, kind of emerges from this potential. But the process in, in, in this is a very complex one. So there is effort, but there's also lots of pleasure. There is desperation. There is sometimes the, the feeling that I am too stuck in my ability to, uh, to, to look inside, another, uh, to look from another perspective. And then you, you keep that, you go do something else, you get back to it, and you incubate again. <laughs> and then you experiment again, and then you do essays and errors, and then s something comes out. And this product is judged by others, so it doesn't belong to you anymore. So the, 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 the inspiration is kind of a collective, the process is in itself collective, but also the appreciation of um, artistic product is also collective, because uh, the, the, the making sense of it doesn't belong to the artist anymore. Once it's put, uh, to um, in front of the senses of other people. Writing is uh, uh, it, it's a result of training. It doesn't, it doesn't come from a sudden <laughs> inspiration again. It's, 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 a, it's a discipline, and then this exercise becomes easier with time, and then also the processing of the negative emotions that come from uh, this uh, being stuck you, pro you train on it also, and you go beyond it at, uh, at some point. Uh, the way you read books also, it's also an exercise. You know, like how do you get inspired when you hear somebody telling you a story? How do you take notes of that? The, it's all actually 
uh, tactics that could be taught also, and that could be uh, you could uh, could be modeled by other people that they have their own ways of dealing with this uh, writing expertise. So it's not something magical. It's not something that comes from from nowhere. It's it's a process uh, that we can use better tools to organize our thoughts. Um, um, we can sometimes just be there at the right moment and see something happening and have this availability to see it happening and, you know, and then do something about it. So it's lots of luck and lots of, lots of um, when I say luck, just being there and having, uh, I don't know who said that, uh, choosing is ex ex excluding. It's like, the wh way do, where, where do I choose to put my eye on? It's, I'm excluding all the other um, uh, visual perception that I can get. And this is gonna, is this gonna be part of what I'm gonna build my, uh, my, my fiction around. If you have a clear idea where do you wanna go, then you're not creating anymore. Just building something that, and you know what you're building at the end. This is what actually makes art, science, entrepreneurship, what we call the uncertainty fields. Because the, the, the condition for it to be interesting is that you are open for it to be uncertain. And this takes, again, energy. This takes energy to accept uncertainty. When I'm faced with uncertainty, my brain doesn't like this void, and it will give me an answer. It will give me a story. And then, so, so doing good science, or, <laughs> do, or, do, or really being in the creative potential, is to refuse that first story that comes to my mind and say, I'm going to keep this uncertainty going. So it needs for you to let go of the obsession of the quality of the product itself. You can get back to that later. But you have to let surrender to the uncertainty of what would this process right now give. And you know, like surrender to it, and then judge it later. We cannot be, at the same time, letting go to the uncertainty of the creation and uh, judging what it could be at the end of, uh, of the way. There's a competition uh, between the exact executive network and the default network and the brain. So you know, you could not be listening to me at the same time and thinking of somebody, someone else. You're alternating between these two tasks, right? So I need to, like, uh, uh, the, the brain creates in a solitude mode. And then it comes to another executive function with judging, what, what did I do? You don't do it at the same time. And you cannot be, I cannot now be talking to you while wondering if you like what I'm saying. I mean, I would not be completely in the process of making sense of what, what I want to say. Then, but when I, when, I, when I finish my sentence, while you're asking the next one, I might think, what did you just, just say? I wouldn't be listening to you anymore. You know, so it's, we're not multitaskers, and we are complex, but we're not as brilliant as we think that we are. That's <laughs> if I think I have a creative genius, or if I think that I don't have the creative genius, when would I create better, right? Actually, the answer is that when I forget about this question, that when I'm not wondering whether I have it or not, is that because the fixed idea of what creative potential and what intelligence is, this is what pollutes our process, of our learning process, our creative uh, process, is considering that they are fixed traits that we have or we don't. And then another reason, so of course, is to demystify the fact that we have a gene for something or we have a part of the brain for something. We know that it's complex, that we are genetically wired, biologically wired, to be shaped by our life experiences, to be shaped by our uh, environment, by our encounters. So we are, by definition, uh, plastic beings. And our brains and our body that could have this genius are not isolated from the rest of what we could get or not to get. So acknowledging that it's impossible for us to um, uh, separate uh, the impact of predispositions from the impact of the opportunity that we had to cultivate this, uh, this potential makes it clear that we should stop being obsessed of the question 
of whether we have talent or not, or to, because anyway, who's gonna judge for the product of that talent? It's always responding uh, for, uh, for a historical moment where we, uh, for, I always think about Lionel Messi uh, in the Renaissance, you know, like uh, what, wh how would you describe his talent? Because he would not be useful at <laughs> that, that time. And that everything that we consider genius, every time that we delve in the stories, of the life stories of those people, we realize that they were just there at the right moment, surrounded by the right people. They did something out of this privilege, but they were at the center of what would make them able to create something that is different. There is no solitary genius, nowhere, in uh, history of science, of art. They are always situated in an ecosystem that represents and inspires and ac make, them make the access uh, to the creation easier. And what's interesting for me is this, this hierarchy that is the um, main reason for us to let go of the effort of building something. Because if I believe that you're better than me, that, uh, that idea will stop me from forgetting about this comparison. So again, um, we cannot be in the same t at the same time um, um, accepting the uncertainty of the creation and at the same time um, obsessed by the question of uh, social competition. Even athletic champions, when they are on the field, they forgot about the competition. They are completely in the flow of the action. Even like uh, maybe the second before I was in the competition, but the minute I started running, my brain is in the flow of the action. I am, I'm just a body, and I'm not seeing. I'm, I'm, people around me are just shapes. And this is what makes us go beyond ourselves. This is how kids play. They're not playing to, you know, the, the, when, you, when you see a baby uh, just, you know, like playing with this rug, he's not interested in any performance, but he's completely in the flow of observing and exploring it. So he is perceiving and creating something that uh, from the outside we wouldn't consider art, but he's actually uh, creating meaning, which is for in his brain a chef-d'oeuvre. There is something interesting that happens in the brain when I am thinking in the presence of others. We see higher activation because the social representation circuits are activated. And it actually brings a better quality to the arguments I'm giving. It makes me um, uh, more um, demanding of, of myself. It has been tested in many, uh, in many um, circumstances. Like, for example, um, the jurors that are going to judge for and, and we think and we uh, give them the opportunities to share their arguments. And we put diverse people there. They're not belonging so, so that we are not falling in the group, the group think bias. And you see that the more diverse they are, the more information they will, they will share and the quality of information will get better. They're tired after that because, um, the, you know, like if I, am, if I am building a story with you, you would not always agree with me. So I will, I will actually be more demanding for the quality of how to convince you that this is how it should go. And when we listen to ourselves talking to others, we become more precise. You know, if you're trying to let somebody else understand your thought, you are getting it better. You are understanding your thought better. So that's why collective story building is may maybe more tiring, but it could end up more interesting. If there is an equal access to the parole, an equal access to the creation, and if there's no hierarchy in considering that a voice uh, uh, is more valuable uh, than others. So it's not enough to be there creating together. I also have to make sure that everybody there does not, is not wondering whether you have more talent than I do. That we are all actually, uh, we forgot about this obsession of diagnosis of, and, and of uh, hierarchy, and we are in the process of creation. So it becomes richer because we are, we are, I am delving into the, 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 the pool of experience that I have, but I'm, it's, it's also getting inside yours. Once we are in the process of creating, it's gonna be cycle. And you know, you do not, 
I think that it's, it's, it's a very dangerous trap to believe that once I'm gonna put something into a paragraph, it has to be perfect. Again, it's a process. It's the same when you want to quit a habit. You know, you quit it one time and then you relapse and then you analyze why did you relapse and you try to shape your environment differently. And you know, we, we are, th th this, this is how it goes in the brain. You perceive and create, perceive and create constantly. So to accept that it doesn't have to be perfect, then it takes all the psycho-emotional pressure of making it uh, the right paragraph. And this comes also with this myth of uh, innate talent and genius is that, that they heard it somewhere. If we come to the Greek mythology, to the idea that we have it today, is that I got it and I put it just through the night, you know, <laughs> in the morning, uh, I, I printed my book and I sent it to the editor. But actually, it is an, a constant experimentation. And we could be more or less demanding of the quality that we are reading. So sometimes you, f you read your text and you see it's, it's, it's actually cr crap. But then you go and look back at it and you see that actually there are some interesting things. Sometimes the opposite happens. You know, so if you're reading your text and you're hungry, you're not gonna judge it the same way if, you, if you're reading it after lunch, if you're cold, if you're going through a heartbreak. If you, so you know, to also understand that your perception of your own product is subjective and is related to sometimes your affective states, sometimes to your, uh, you know, like physiological states. So yeah, it's, I find it a bit dangerous to separate the ideation from the creation. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much.